I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Kevin Boyd. He's a pediatric, pediatric dentist in Chicago. He's an att attending instructor <clears throat> in the pediatric, pediatric dentistry residency program at Lurie's Children's Hospital, where he also served as a dental consultant. His clinical focus is the prevention of oral and systemic diseases through the promotion of healthy eating, physical activity, sleeping and breathing. His primary, primary research interests are infant and early childhood feeding practices and how they impact the palatal facial development, nasal respiratory competence, and neurocognitive neurobehavioral behavioral development. He is currently a visiting consulting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, doing postdoctoral research in the areas of anthropology and orthodontics. Please enjoy our first recorded presentation by Dr. Kevin Boyd. Good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening. Uh, Kevin Boyd here from Chicago. Sorry I can't be with you all in Seattle, but uh, I really enjoy talking with this group. I've spoken a couple of times, Chicago and Boston, and uh, Seattle, one of my favorite cities. I can't be there, but uh, appreciate the invitation. So I'm going to share my screen and get right down to this. I've got an hour, uh, and hopefully this will be a productive hour for all of you, interesting and useful material. Um, some of it is, uh, I would say, reinforcing of previous talks. Maybe some of the slides will be similar. So sorry if uh, that's repetitious to some of you who have heard me speak before, but um, usually there's other people that I really like to give them the opportunity to um, have the tools to open up uh, some, some of the uh, hypotheses that I'm going to be uh, introducing and, and giving support for. Um, John Lennon uh, was heard saying this to Paul McCartney when he was 15 years old and drunk on a playground before they were Beatles. He's, uh, I thought it was appropriate for, for the topic uh, of airway. So uh, I'm gonna move into health span. What is health span and what is lifespan? Uh, so when I'm back. 80 years old, when I'm 90, hopefully when I'm, when I'm 100, 100 years old, uh, be able to interact with things I always worry about is, is being dependent on somebody. And health continue to be engaged and productive. I hope to become an old, young, active person. Over the course of human history, most people died before the age of 10, with an exceptional few living into their 60s and 70s. Around 150 years ago, a remarkable shift occurred, and the average length of life began to increase. Every decade, about two years were added to average life expectancy. This trend continued in Western Europe and North America until, by the close of the 20th century, life expectancy had doubled for most people in the developed world. In those additional 30 years of life that we added in the 20th century, we call the first longevity revolution. It was primarily improvements in public health, like clean water, uh, sanitation, indoor living and working environments, controlled uh, air temperature. These are all the things that created very harsh conditions for people in the early part of the 20th century. We wanted to live longer. We didn't want our children to die. We succeeded in doing this. Uh, and we got exactly what we, we wished for. Today, the numbers of people living to old age and to super old age are rising around the globe. To live a long life is a monumental achievement, and longer lifespans are precious gifts for everyone. But there is another side to this story. 50% of the children born now will live naturally to over 100 years. But if we don't increase health span, what it means is that individuals are gonna still succumb to cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and neurodegenerative disease at some point between their 40s and their 70s. Developed nations are spending a growing share of their total wealth trying to hold back a fast approaching silver tsunami of chronic diseases and disabilities of aging. Baby boomers who were born uh, post-World War II are now aging into what we sometimes refer to as retirement age. Uh, post 65 and we're seeing this in some of our social programs and the upheaval that that's going to cause to society is tremendous. This is referred to as the silver tsunami. So what really over the course of the next hour I would like to uh, develop the hypothesis that a 
you know, the, the title of the slide, Aging uh, Essentially Begins in Childhood. Uh, if, if people are absolutely going to live longer, kids alive today will most likely live to 100 plus. Uh, but will they live well uh, into their old age? What the narrator said was, you know, by 40, 50, 60, most kid, most, most people, uh, adults, middle age, uh, you know, approaching senior citizenship, um, they have chronic disease uh, that usually is brought about by unhealthy lifestyle. Now, un, you know, lifestyle components aren't just diet, nutrition, and physical activity exercise but also sleep and breathing and, and breathing habitually through the nose. If that starts very early in childhood, that a child has conferred that ability uh, to live up to their genomic potential for their jaws and faces and airways to grow normally, that that is what is going to be uh, predispose them to not only longer uh, lifespans, uh, life expectancy at birth, but also prolonged health into old age, maybe even in uh, to their hundreds. It'd be nice to be healthy up until your dying day. Uh, that, that, and that is not that unrealistic. My mom was a good example, 90 years old, and she was really hardly ever sick a day in her life. So anyway, um, let's move on and hopefully I can convince some of you of the reality of this. Uh, if I can get the slides to advance, sorry. Is not valuable time here. I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. Maxillary expansion in the primary dentition implications for improved health related quality of life was my originally submitted title. Uh, implications for increased lifespan and health span. And again, health span is the amount of your lifespan that you are actually healthy and have a high quality of life to go along with your higher quantity of life. Um, I'm going to discuss how the jaws, face, and the teeth are intimately connected to the airway. And you can't separate them. We say the back of the face is the airway. The front of the airway is the face. And this is now being adopted by the American Dental Association that uh, dent uh, dentist responsibility is to assure that their patients not only have healthy teeth and gums, uh, and, but, but properly formed jaws uh, and, and facial structures that are conducive to habitually breathing through the nose as early in life as is feasible. And feasibility means, uh, if for me anyway, a pediatric dentist, uh, we, our policy is we like to see kids for their first dental visit on or before age one. So quite often the earliest feasible age that I can do my best to try to educate parents on the importance of shaping their jaws uh, such that, that it will be conducive to nose breathing. Um, I have a huge opportunity and, and it's a privilege uh, to, to help parents understand this about this component of wellness. Uh, before the age of one, or certainly, you know, very early in life, uh, more so than than most other health professionals, unless they're, you know, involved in early childhood development, such as a developmental ophthalmologist, a ear, nose, and throat doctor, pediatrician, family physician. Um, it, it's really this has not really been part of our conversation until fairly recently. Um, however. Prior to World War I, uh, this was often a, a, a collaborative conversation between physicians and dentists, how important it was to work together to try to widen their jaws, spread the deciduous arch, it was called, or the temporary teeth, baby teeth, um, not for the purpose of straightening them, uh, even though it does confer cosmetic benefits when you do expand little kids. Um, it's more for the purpose of in improving nasal respiratory competence. There's lots of evidence to support uh, this relationship. So this is uh, the, the title. So this is a compliment to what I, uh, 2019, I spoke about pre-apnea, like pre-diabetes, uh, you know, pre-eclampsia, 
uh, things like that. There's, there's lots of pre diseases. Uh, and, and we, what we want to do is pick up on antecedent symptoms before they turn into full blown disease. Um, and that's what you'll be learning about, uh, over the course of this. I, um, recently spoke at the Ancestral Health Society. And it's interesting because uh, in Boston two years ago, it was right on the heels of speaking at the Ancestral Health Society. And many people contacted me afterwards wanting to know more about the Ancestral Health Society. And I encourage everybody here listening to this, if, if this material is, is useful to you, you should consider um, attending one of these meetings. Uh, they're incredible. It's made up of all kinds of healthcare professionals, such as yourself, that are in, interested in functional medicine um, and in improving wellness uh, as early in life as possible. Um, I just spoke with um, James Nestor, who's the author of this book, and, and we actually were consultants uh, for him on this book. And um, he was... Uh, talking about these are the skulls that, that I told you about at the previous couple, couple of meetings that I've been analyzing with Dr. Mariana Evans and Dr. Janet Mon. She's the curator of the Penn Museum. These are all pre-industrial skulls, anywhere from uh, you know stillborn fetuses to 50 year old people you know that lived th hundreds and even thousands of years ago. One thing that's ubiquitous to, to all of them, is they all had well-formed jaws, even, even you know, kids who died in childhood, even, even the fetuses, their jaws were well-formed. Um, infectious disease and predation, there's all kinds of reasons why people didn't survive past childhood. And like Martha Stewart was narrating in the opening video, most people up until about 150 years ago uh, didn't live till past age 10. Well, that you know, a lot of people, not a lot, but a significant amount of people did actually live into middle age. And, and even uh, 60s and 70 years old, you can find skulls of 60s, 70 year old people uh, from a thousand years ago. Uh, but it's balanced by uh, the high incidence of uh, infant mortality. So that's why that, that statistic is ac actually quite accurate, that the average age was about 10 years old. So that's all changed. But um, how well are we going to, you know, how long will we stay healthy? So anyway, I, I encourage anyone to read this book. Um, he and I had lunch uh, yet several times during the course of the three-day meeting. And we saw this marquee at a movie theater, Don't Breathe. And, and we sort of photoshopped that in there through your mouth. So that's really what this whole lecture is going to be about, uh, the importance of breathing through your nose. All air is not created equal. Um, you know, air is air. What do you mean? What difference does it make if you breathe through your mouth? I've had physicians say that to me. Oxygen is oxygen. The oxygen that you breathe in from the environment is mixed with other gases, uh, sometimes pollutants. Air quality index is a new uh, uh, algorithm that, that we pay attention to. Um, but there's, there's, the air is cold relative to 98.6 unless you're in a rainforest. Um, it's dry, uh, again, unless you're in a year, real humid climate. And there's all kinds of airborne pathogens uh, in the air. So uh, what happens is when you breathe through your nose, these turbinates, turbine, it, it really rattles the air and it acts uh, like a catalyst to form a compound called one nitrogen and one oxygen, nitric oxide, which is a powerful antioxidant. And amongst the pathogens that are airborne that it kills is coronaviruses. Now, if it's effective against the Delta variant, we're not sure of that. But if you're an anti-masker or you know somebody who is that you're concerned about, uh, then tell them, please do all you can for yourselves and your children to breathe through the nose. At least they have a chance uh, to actually extinguish the virus in the nasal cavity. Not much work has been done on this, uh, on this recent pandemic, but there is lots of research to suggest that several species of coronavirus do succumb to the toxic effect of nitric oxide through nose breathe there. Um, this is a drawing I had done for a couple of essays I wrote in an orthodontic journal. Uh, this one is actually from Darwinian Dentistry Part Two. Anybody 
Um, you can download, they're, they're free online, or if you need them, we can send them to you. Um, this is what a typical palette looks like in kids that come to me. And most of the orthodontists don't want to see kids at this age and, and people who are influenced by the orthodontic profession who they do a lot of good things. I'm, I'm not here to trash orthodontists. I'm, I'm here to trash the curriculum. Um, they're not teaching orthodontists how to treat little children because and, and I'm a pediatric dentist who only does orthodontics now. Uh, there isn't much decay in my practice because I was a, uh, trained as a dietitian before I was a dentist. And I've always made nutrition counseling uh, and disparagement of sugar a uh, very, very strong component of our patient education protocol. So we can spend a lot of time doing this. And we're treating orthodontically. I'm pretty much limiting my practice now to children under the age of six who have jaws that are shaped like this and that you know either will reliably predict it will get worse as they get older. Um, and could be already uh, comorbidity with sleep-related breathing disorder or apnea is the worst case scenario of that. So this is something that um, those of you watching, if you have your own kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, nieces, their nephews, and somebody's telling you to wait till they're, you know, reliably like, oh, save up your money for braces, but we don't want to see them till they're 11 or 12 or 10 you know what, a seven-year-old, and that's really when the American Association of Orthodontists recommends a child by seven years old, they get their first orthodontic evaluation, but usually don't get treatment till about 11 or 12. Uh, that is, a seven-year-old's a geriatric patient in my practice. Uh, there, it's, it's not too late, but you know the, the ideal age to treat them is at 30, 30 months of age or, or three years, two, two and a half to three years old, when they have all 20 of their baby teeth, okay? This is, um, you know, this, this child here is already getting permanent teeth in figure seven. Those two front teeth are there. Uh, but, you know, this is, so this is what happens here is this nitrogen oxide will kill all these pathogens and the air is humidified and it is warmed and it's much easier to get into the blood vessels again, because of the nitric oxide it also facilitates diffusion across the, uh, the lungs, the alveoli of the lungs into the bloodstream, uh, to the hepatic portal system, uh, to the heart, to the brain. Uh, and when you mouth breathe, you do not get that efficiency uh, of getting oxygen to where it's needed. Uh, so anyway, this is what I started uh, my last lecture to this group in 2019 in Boston is this has been known by anthropologists for decades that malocclusion, that is just poorly aligned teeth and jaws. And we used to just say, oh, well, you know, we can straighten those teeth when they're older. But because of the intimate connection to the respiratory apparatus, is this is not something that should wait. It, it, there, there are cases where it, it, it is okay to delay treatment. But for the most part, if a child's jaw is too narrow and if it's too far back, like, you know, chinlessness, like Mitch McConnell, not, nothing political, but you know, and he had polio as a child, but his chin is really deficient. Uh, Queen Victoria, if you ever see a picture of her, she has no chin. Um, Jay Leno, he has no maxilla, his, his upper jaw is too far back. And there's a lot of people who have both jaws that are too far back. That means there's no room for their tongue. And where will the tongue go if it can't rest forward and upward on the roof of the mouth? It will go into the airway especially when they're sleeping. This is not a good thing for anybody, but especially for growing children. So here again, I'm not meaning to disparage the you know, orthodontist per se, it's the curriculum and, and it doesn't teach. Like I, I had to learn how to you know, manage anxiety in children because I'm a pediatric dentist and mainly for doing fillings and giving injections and things like that. And I had to take a lot of child development courses and we had to demonstrate extreme competence before we could become board certified, get our certificates in pediatric dentistry in behavior management, behavior guidance. And not, you know, sometimes we have to put these kids to sleep, but for the most part, we did our, we want to manage them while they're awake. Well, orthodontists don't get that training because why would we need that? You know, we're not trained in that because we're not supposed to do treatment until they're older. That is the implication, even though it might not be emphatically stated. So 
This is something that's very interesting about the ADA. Talk about this because this is such a hot topic. You just got back from the ADA Roundtable uh, uh, Airway Summit, Pediatric Air Summit. There was an ENT there, two pediatric dentists, three orthodontists, two myofunctional therapists, one pediatric psychologist, five GPs, and one prosthodontist, that was you, assembling the best experts in the world on airway. Now, this first of all, let's talk about why this subject was important and what was the purpose of this meeting. Yeah, it was a real honor to get an opportunity to be there. Um, Steve Carstensen, who practices up in Seattle or outside, right outside of Seattle, and also runs the sleep course at Spear Education, put it all together. He did an incredible job, which was actually interesting. Um, Steve really uh, was an air, was a sleep guy. He was an adult. I mean, he was kind of the fat old man that would come to his practice and he'd make an advancement appliance. And that was, and then he got this real interest in pediatric um, uh, screening and assisting them and becoming and getting healthier. And it happened right at the same time the American Dental Association was taking an interest in it as well. So at last year's ADA meeting, they actually came out with some statements that were very supportive of dentists being involved in the world. of. It's still somewhat limited, their view. The world of sleep was pretty much their focus for adults. So their statement was basically that we need to start looking at apnea in adults. We need to do some sort of questionnaires in the practice. Um, when we make appliances that they said we ought to be titrating them and using screening tools like a pulse oximeter to help us do that. And so that was, that was fairly supportive from the adult standpoint. The, the thing that they really came out in, in very strong support of was dentistry's role in the prevention of this problem and being able to get to the pediatric patient earlier. So they actually, I've got the policy statement here, they came out with a policy statement that said in children, Screening through history and clinical examination may identify signs and symptoms of deficient growth and development or other risk factors that may lead to airway issues. So that's what you're going to learn about today is what are some of these signs and symptoms and that really you need to probably inform your pediatrician and your, your any dentist that sees your children, whether it's a pediatric dentist or a family dentist, you might be the person to make them aware of this because uh, it's still, it's not taught in dental or medical school yet. Uh, but the evidence to support that this is best practice has been around for over a hundred years. And I'm going to be quoting some, some studies that were done in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s about this. Another reason, again, that I alluded to about uh, getting children to breathe through their nose, um, if they're not going to be mandatory wearing masks at school. It's just really in your child's best interest or any child that you know, or that you might um, have some sway over policy. Uh, they, they, they need to have the best ability to breathe through their nose. Um, the, the number, I'm, I'm on staff at Lurie Children's Hospital. It's one of the best children's hospitals in the country. Um, and we're just getting lots of new patients that are and little kids that are getting COVID. So um, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully it'll get better. I just spoke to uh, a children's hospital dental group in Miami. And um, so I was finding some uh, evidence to, to share with them and, and they know it all too well, but to, to just, uh, uh, so this was in Texas here as well. A lot of these States that aren't, um, mandating masks and it's just uh it's got to change something's got to change so this is uh, a brief video country we're seeing more and more children getting infected a record number of kids are currently being treated for covid 19 in u.s hospitals so you've all this is this was fairly new stuff when i gave this talk you've all heard about this so and then hopefully it's just not going to get much worse um so anyway this is um, a talk that I, I recently gave that, that, and this is a really all I'm being asked to talk about now. And, and I'm constantly being sent new material and finding new uh, evidence to, to support why we need to get busy um, helping kids breathe better through their nose. Air quality index, AQI, you know, from the, the smoke and the forest fires and, 
uh, the toxic fumes coming out of exhaust. And it's, it's, you know, it's the same thing. I, there's no study that's been done, but they have these alerts if the uh, air quality index is high uh, that some kids, sometimes they want kids to stay home. Well, what about if they're mouth breathers? It's probably even harder on them. Nose breathing kids would probably stand a better chance even, you know, not just because of COVID or airborne pathogens, but just the quality of the gases in the air, sulfur dioxides and uh, nitrous oxides. There's all kinds of, um, you know, lead uh, in the air. So, um, and of course, you know, COVID. So I, I won't beat that to death, but it's, it's just really uh, important to this conversation. Um, Early childhood malocclusion, uh, deciduous malocclusion. That just means poorly developing jaws, misaligned teeth in preschool age kids under the age of 72 months old, okay? Under age six. Oh, please. Gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I don't know why this does this. Um, anyway, um, it's highly prevalent public health problem uh, within industrialized societies, non-self-correcting. Okay, if a child has a narrow and retrusive and long face, that is not going to get better. It always gets worse. Uh, and it should not be, you know, parents should not be told, wait till you're older to fix it because it can cause systemic disease. It can contribute to it. Uh, it it's very hard to find a causal relationship between poorly shaped jaws and children and sleep apnea. So right away they say, oh, well, you know, you better it, there's no causal relationship there's no prospective longitudinal study you know evidence based well there's lots of evidence but it's not of the nature where you withhold treatment from one group of kids and give it to another that's against the law that's unethical there will never be a prospective trial on this because it's been known for 100 years that widening a kid's jaw before the age of 6 will absolutely correlate with a easier ability to breathe through the nose but that is not based on a prospective longitudinal controlled trial. Um, so the, the, the associated, uh, the, these, uh, when, the, when the jaws are, are small and narrow, this is often associated or will become associated with sleep uh, problems and respiratory problems. So this is the hypothesis. Orthodontic, meaning teeth, you know, aligning the teeth, Dental facial orthopedic, that's the jaw and facial bones and the bones of the respiratory complex that are connected. In young children with a diagnosis of early childhood malocclusion, that's before the age of six years old, uh, can often coincide with optimization of sleep-related respiratory health in pediatric patients and not only improve the quality of life, but also the quantity of life. So... Um, and slow down the rate of aging. That's what increasing health span means. We need to slow down the rate of aging in people. Uh, and, you know, I, my, one of my research partners, uh, Milt Gavilis, he does tongue tie releases on kids. Uh, I met his mother-in-law for dinner the other day at their house. And she's in her, she's 92 years old and her skin is perfect. Her eyes are clear. She is sharp as a tack. That is a woman who has uh, a huge longevity uh, of, of her health span. Um, so anyway, I'm, this is one of my heroes. He's a physician dentist from the late 19th, early 20th century who limited his, he went to dental school after medical school. And what he did, and, and I did talk about this at my last meeting, so sorry to be repetitious, but this man, there's not much known about him, and I'm determined to get him understood by the medical and dental professions. Um, he saw, he had practices in Paris, Chicago, New York, Boston, uh, and he was amazing, and he limited his practice to kids under the age of six, go figure, doing orthodontics, not for the purpose of straightening teeth or what he called um, improving irregularities of teeth, but to improve the ability uh, to breathe through the nose. That was his main goal. It did confer orthodontic benefits on these kids. Their, their teeth did come in straighter uh, uh, and their smiles were more aesthetic, but that isn't really why he did it. Um, this is something that he determined that by age four, and you know what, tell this to your orthodontist. If you're an orthodontist, 
uh, is telling you to wait, your kid, you know, is not old enough, have him measure the distance between the upper second baby molars. It should be 24 millimeters plus the kid's age to be in the range of having room for the tongue. Dr. Bogue figured this out uh, over a hundred years ago. And we use it on every patient. By age four or five, kids should have, you should be able to put a nickel between the, the spaces of their front teeth. And that coincides you know, with this. Now, kids get taller after four or five, but guess what? Their jaws don't get wider really appreciably, not necessarily enough. Uh, you can straighten their teeth, but they can still be too narrow because the tongue doesn't fit. So. The, the, the upper jaw maxilla is really the framework within which the lower jaw grows. And the upper jaw grows according to an in, intermembranous, like a neural growth pattern that, that it's like your brain uh, grows your cranial vault because you have sutures here, fontanelles, the soft spots in a baby's head. And as the brain grows, that can grow that whole cranium. And that's usually by about 10 years, 9, 10 years old, you're 90% of your adult brain size. And that means your head circumference isn't going to change. But after a 9, 10 years old, you're still going to get taller. Things grow at different rates. Uh, and that's called allometry, which I did not learn in dental school or pediatric dentistry residency. I learned it from anthropologists is that because a person will get taller after four or five years old, these, this jaw isn't going to get much wider at the level of the teeth. Now, the bones at the base of the bones and the lower jaw, that will grow, of course, but not so much at the level of the teeth. The tongue is responsible for growing the upper palatal facial suture complex in as much as the same way that the brain is responsible for growing the cranial vault with this sutural complex. Our, in, in prior to industry, our ancestors, our human, you know, homo sapiens ancestors, and, and our, our, you know, genus homo is, is two and a half million years old, anatomically modern humans, that's about 250, maybe 300,000 years we've been like this. Our genome is really little changed, but it was grown just like the brain grew, grew the cranium, the way kids were nursed and weaned and, and, um, uh, you know, then post weaning was on to hard, firm, unprocessed foods. That's what grew the whole craniofacial complex. Uh, it was uh, Melvin Moss um, was at Columbia University and came up with the functional matrix theory. The functional matrix of the jaws and, and face is food. That is the functional matrix. The airway is air. Air grows the nasal airway. If you've got a child habitually nose breathing from birth, that air will expand. It'll help expand the soft tissues and the hard tissues of the airway. Food and in the process, biologically processing um, non-commercially processed foods, not baby foods, but breastfeeding and weaning onto firm, fresh, it's called baby led weaning, uh, will grow this complex. Uh, what we do is rescue. Um, I start expanding them at two and a half, three years old uh, when when it, there aren't cultural obstacles in the way. Some people just, they're not, they can't accept it. My orthodontist said no. And, you know, they, Dr. Boyd, you're not an orthodontist. Well, no kidding. <laughs> I'm not an orthodontist. And, you know, that people are sort of like worried that I'm going to be offended by that. And, you know, no, I'm not. Uh, that I, I have behavior management skills that I had to learn in dental school and in my residency. This is a real interesting paper, a series of papers by Dr. Bogue in 19, uh, 19, 13, 1912 to 1913. He wrote 11 papers. And this one, these articles are revolutionary, at least with regards to our ordinary thoughts concerning dentistry. They carry us back to the very first principles of our profession, the very first principles of our profession. I never heard this in dental school that we shall render constructive aid at the time when nature can build that aid into the body structure to the greatest advantage. In other words, give a child a breathing and masticatory apparatus that's connected that can help them sustain, acquire and sustain health for their entire lives such that they will not need artificial growing like what I do with my expanders. There's, this was done naturally for hundreds of thousands of years. 
it will be a long time before we get back to those principles. But uh, in, in the meantime, after we do some expansion, there's something called myofunctional therapy uh, that helps grow the craniofacial respiratory complex. But this is really powerful. They, they carry us back to first principles of our profession. They don't teach this in dental school. Uh, not at all. We, we repair and restore. We do fillings, okay? And we take people with that in the end. We put them in appliances to make their jaws come forward as adults. You know, that's hardly um, getting back to first principles. But anyway, I won't uh, harp on that. Um, the correction of irregularities of the temporary teeth, that's the baby teeth, for very young children is the most important work of modern dentistry. I hope to show that the best of our constructive dentistry must be done by the time the child is six years old. That such work before the age of six facilitates the development of the child's whole body as it cannot do at any other age. That it enables nature to do for the child in the most advantageous manner, much, much that we have sought to do at later age and with great trouble. That such dentistry can be done easily, quickly and practically without pain that the cooperation of the child and its parents may be enlisted and that the results are permanent in a degree, which is not always true of the work that's done at a later age. I have, and I'm gonna show some of my results, but I now have over a decade of results, hundreds of children before the age of six that we have really developed very well uh, in, in this regard. Um, and this is the last thing I'll read to you. I don't like people who read their slides, but I felt compelled to do this. Some of my friends in the profession have taken up this work for children and the results are a little short of marvelous. They have reformed cranky dispositions, ADD anybody in attention, enable children to voluntarily breathe through the nose. Hey, who knew, you know, this is like a, over, a, this is over a hundred years ago, they were saying this. Uh, Aided very materially in physical development, promised to facilitate the eruption of practically perfect sets of permanent teeth. Well, you know what? I don't promise that, but I do give parents uh, optimism that, that their permanent teeth will come in better, but they're most likely going to benefit from Invisalign when they're teenagers. And we don't do much teenage braces anymore. We usually put them in Invisalign and it's much better tolerated by teenagers. If any of you have teenage kids in braces or you yourself did, you know how cumbersome they can be. Um, look at this, a hundred years old. These were made, they didn't have acrylic. This is vulcanized rubber. And this is what we call a Hyrex appliance now. You know, and it's like these have been around since the 1800s, these expanders. And this, these look almost identical to the ones that we use now. So look at this, 1860, expanding the jaws. That's a typical one. So this is also, um, you know, another talk that I gave a couple months ago. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about, oh, I'm sorry, this is a repetition. I didn't mean to get that out of there. Um, this is... Um, I showed this at my last lecture in Boston for the IOMT, is that uh, they call it evolutionary medicine. We call it evolutionary oral medicine. We have to start thinking about disease from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and again, why did natural, if we understand how natural selection works, we can figure out disease. We can come up with a reasonable hypothesis for why certain diseases happen. Um, we've known about this tangentially because of antibiotic resistance that they develop you know, stronger uh, uh, genotypes that, that can survive the antibiotics we give them. But uh, fever, why didn't natural selection get rid of fever? It's, it's a nuisance because fever, the fever mechanism makes life impossible for the pathogens that have entered our blood. And if we survive the fever, we're gonna survive and live long enough to pass on our genes. That's called evolutionary fitness. So I'm working with others to develop this, this framework, this educational framework for the discipline of dentistry, uh, specifically pediatric dentistry. Um, and this is a focus group I was a part of back in 2012 uh, for three days. Um, there was a grant that supported uh, 12 um, dentists and 12 anthropologists to go to Duke University, trying to solve the problem of why is it that dentists don't know much about evolutionary explanations for, for the cause of dental disease. 
And why do anthropologists not understand how applicable their field work is, their theory that they've been developing in the field of healthcare? And I've lectured all over the world because of this meeting. I lecture dentistry to anthropology departments and I lecture anthropology to dentistry departments. And um, now it's just become mainstay for me. Um, so the answer uh, is probably more than that now. When I first started this exploration about 12 years ago, um, they were thinking humans, anatomically modern humans were maybe around for 100,000 years. And it's maybe three times that. So ontogeny is just when does a, a trait or, or a disease trait, um, ontogeny is from conception to death. But when does it, you know, if you see a kid this age with a jaw that's too far back um, from an ontogeny or ontological uh, uh, perspective, when did that start? And we're suggesting uh, perhaps in utero, um, we can measure, uh, you know, the profile at about 20 weeks gestation and our hypothesis that we're going to be testing at a major um, dental school's orthodontic department out east. Uh, does this reliably predict uh, that after birth that this kid is going to have uh, a retronathic jaw? Um, so more later on that. Um, so anyway, I've actually, this is one of my patients. Um, who the mom, I was treating four of her other kids and she would, would travel from Milwaukee to Chicago, a retired hygienist named Laura End. And she said, boy, am I, do I, do I have another patient developing in my womb for you, Dr. Kev? And um, sure enough, this was him at about, I don't know, 18 months old. And I did end up needing to expand him. So phylogeny as opposed to mitogeny is just the tribe, like genus homo. 2.5 million years. So that's the, you know, our, our species family. You could even go back to our last universal common ancestor that they, the acronym LUCA, which is, are you ready for this? Four billion years ago. Everything on the planet now shares in common two things. One is nucleic acids, you know, uh, RNA first, then DNA. We think RNA preceded DNA and the Krebs cycle how we can form energy, uh, ATP, from pyruvate. And it runs in reverse too, reverse Krebs cycle, but that's the universal to everything that's ever been alive and uh, everything that's alive today. So um, malocclusion doesn't really enter into the human condition till after the industrial revolution, when women entered into the workforce, the textile mills. More later on that, but, uh, that is something that's been known about for a long time. So phylogeny is like, when did it happen? And you know, our, we, we diverged from the chimpanzee um, about five, six, maybe even seven million years ago. And all that time, uh, we didn't live very long and there weren't that very many of us, but uh, we didn't die with crooked teeth or impacted with some teeth, just was a non-entity. Tooth decay doesn't enter until we, found uh, how to plant food and process cereal grains and separate fiber from the carbohydrate. That's when you start to see appreciable tooth decay. 400 million years ago is when fish crawled onto land and their limbs turned into legs and they had something called a swim bladder that would regulate like ballast, uh, the, the depth uh, in the water. Well, that swim bladder was filled with air and that bladder was vascularized. That became the lung. Our human lungs have a set of homeobox genes, Hox genes, that you know, if you could do this experiment, you could put the, the lungfish uh, Hox genes into a human embryo and substitute it and they would grow a lung. So um, obviously you can't do an experiment like that, but they've done it with other appendages and it's, it's pretty amazing. Look it up, Hox genes, um, their toolbox genes. The last major milestone in the seven million years of hominin evolution is the emergence of modern humans or homo sapiens, people who for the first time fundamentally looked and behaved like us. While a date of around 200,000 years ago was frequently given for this dynamic, there is still substantial debate regarding the timing as something that was an ongoing process 
rather than a single point in geological time. Anatomically, it is widely recognized that facial size reduction or gracilization or feminization, as it is sometimes called, as well as facial retraction are key defining traits for our species. So this is what we found. I, again, Dr. Mariana Evans is an orthodontist at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and we're visiting scholars at the museum and we've been gathering data for over eight years now. Um, but what we find is, is that the bone that supports the upper front teeth always is ahead of this line in pre-industrial skulls. That means that there's sufficient tongue anterior tongue space that the tongue can be off the airway. And not only are there wisdom teeth, but there's space behind the wisdom teeth. Uh, so that's one dimension. We, we look at uh, orthodontically, we look at things in three planes of space. One is you know, front to back, uh, anterior posterior or length of, of the jaws. And that's why I was saying, you know, not to pick on Mitch McConnell, but you know, he has inadequate length of his lower jaw and probably his upper jaw as well. But before the industrial revolution, pretty much everyone except royalty because they were, they were not nursed uh, the same way because nursing was considered um, primitive of the proletariat, royalty didn't do that. Uh, there also another hypothesis for why royalty did not want their queens and princesses to nurse is because of lactation and menorrhea. That means that um, if the mom was nursing, it was difficult for her to get pregnant again. Well, the king wants more male heirs. He wants more heirs and he wants most, mostly male heirs, right? So that is uh, uh, an anthropological hypothesis for why nursing was only done by the proletariat. Um, and, but there was no crooked teeth in the proletariat. And when there were crowded crooked teeth, and even the royalty, they weren't that bad, but they weren't as good as a proletariat. I focus on um, neonates um, and, and fetuses and usually uh, kids that are still have a substantial amount of baby teeth when they died hundreds of years ago. Uh, my partner, Mariana, uh, works on adults, and we take these uh, skulls out of the museum and transport them to her office where we have a three-dimensional cone beam uh, x-ray setup, and we compare them. We're, we're wanting to develop a set of anthropologically informed normal values for, for how wide the jaws should be, how long they should be, and how vertical, uh, you know, the proper, are they, are they growing long-faced? or are they overclosed? Those are our three dimensions. If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. We not only became shorter and fatter, but our jaws got narrower, they got more retrusive, and they got longer. Uh, long, longer faces, but uh, right away, I mean, after the discovery of agriculture, um, you know, 12, 15,000 years ago, well, the jaws started to get narrow, but not that quickly. And the teeth actually got smaller too. So there, there really wasn't a substantial amount of crowding until in the industrial revolution, which is, you know, 10,000 years later. But, but um, they, they, things went in lockstep with each other is, uh, but then when the industry came along, it just, the jaws got so narrow, but the teeth were still the same size. Um, this is what um, Rick Robley is an orthodontist in Arkansas that I do some work with. And Jerry Rose was head of the anthropology department and I was appointed as an adjunct professor there to mentor uh, research of dental anthropology PhD students. What Dr. Rose uh, found in his research is that Jaws got more retrusive with uh, industry. They got longer, more vertical, and they got narrower. Uh, and this is very typical of what we see uh, in my patients. Um, so parents are really important. Hello, my name is Janet Castillo. This is Julian. Julian is 10 years old. He is diagnosed um, with, with Down syndrome along with some medical condition, other medical conditions. Um, we found Dr. Boyd through Dr. Lagmani. We came here three years ago asking for help to improve his breathing after a few surgeries with no success to help um, with severe sleep apnea. 
Dr. Ward and staff have been a blessing to our family. Not just his breathing got better, but also his hearing got better. His hearing improved tremendously. Julian is now sleeping better, sleeping all night, and he's also hearing better. His speech has improved tremendously. So he was diagnosed with irreversible congenital hearing loss. And so it was obviously a misdiagnosis because, um, and he was nonverbal because he couldn't hear and hearing aids weren't helping him. But when we expanded him, um, all of us, the, the, the audiologists were, and I have the reports, we're going to publish it as a case study. And he started talking. So, the, you know, these are things, that's an extreme case, but it's really almost every kid that we treat, there's things start, start to stop, they stop getting worse. And, and then it often will just completely mitigate the problems associated with sleep and breathing. Um, so anyway, these are fetuses that died, you know, 500 years ago. And look how forward the jaws are. I mean, if you look on an ultrasound um, of your own children, you know, the jaws usually aren't this forward. So we think something might be going on you know, with the mother's eating, breathing, uh, we don't know what it is that is stunting the growth of the jaws. Uh, and it just gets worse after birth because of, you know, I mean, we, we like to encourage breastfeeding. Uh, I tend to support it, but you know, when a man starts talking about breastfeeding, women just roll their eyes, you know, what does he know? So I, I usually let my female assistants, uh, do that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, these are what, uh, pallets are flat, they were long, uh, they were wide. Uh, so, and it's just un ubiquitous until about maybe 250 years ago is when it starts to creep in. One thing we can say is that we know that this 35 year old guy who died 5,000 years ago, he had to have looked like that when he was about six years old. How do I know that? Because if he didn't have a jaw like that, he never would have survived childhood. That means he wasn't nursed and weaned according to an ancestral pattern. And he never could have developed jaws like this if he didn't have a similar analogous uh, shape to his arches before. Now, how about this guy? Can you tell me anything about what he looked like when he was almost six years old? No, you can't. This is what he looked like two years before I did orthodontics on him. So you can't predict really anything about what it person's jaw looks like, looked like when they were younger, um, because everyone, not everyone needed uh, to have perfect jaws to survive childhood. We can survive childhood with all kinds of diseases now. Uh, and, and of course, that, that's a good thing. But, um, you know, there, there's are other kinds of problems that are brought on because um, what would have you know, eliminated us before it doesn't, but we grow, we, we live longer, but you know, we're getting diseases at earlier ages. So this is, um, and I'm not going to go into that, but that, you know, that, that when, when breastfeeding happens, the, the, the baby's tongue, the infant's tongue will push the nipple against those sutures and grows the jaws and it makes them wide. It, kids who are intubated preemies, their, their palates get these grooves in them and they, they can't develop normally. Um, so we used to do these studies at Iowa when I was a Reddit resident. Well, this is what the palates um, used to look like on every child that was ever born successfully up until about, you know, 250 years ago. And this is what we use, uh, we shoot for when we start expanding children by two and a half or three years old. So um, an analogy can be made if we do screening for children for, for visual acuity issues uh, or speech or hearing, why in the world wouldn't we do it for sleep and breathing? Uh, and that's a good analogy. And I tell parents when I do consultations, if you are getting any grief from any relatives, you're treating too early, uh, you can say, well, what about glasses? I mean, would you tell a parent to wait till a kid's driving a car to correct his nearsightedness? That could cause brain damage if you let vision get as bad as it's gonna get. And that's kind of what's happening. There's the British uh, Journal is saying we need to develop uh, an index, something that can predict reliably a risk for sleep apnea based upon the shape of the jaw. This was seven years ago. Uh, really, not much has been done with it. But I'm, you know, I'm finding other things 
Early childhood malocclusion, again, I'm trying to define this for my colleagues so it's easier to explain it to parents. Um, that's what we do for cavities, early childhood cavities. That's before the age of six, a cavity. Um, and it helps insurance companies. Um, it makes them responsible for paying for things because it's a simpler diagnosis. When we talk about decay that way, we got to talk about malocclusion that way. Uh, and, and as of now, um, orthodontics is considered cosmetic. It's not. It, it can, there, there are cosmetic advantages to having your teeth aligned, but this is a, absolutely something that, that I am determined to help change. This is what affects health span, okay? So, I mean, if you're getting, you know, chronic COPD at 45, um, you're probably not gonna live, you know, to the average lifespan, uh, or even if you did, it's gonna be a crappy life. Um, and then, you know, if you're getting lung, colorectal cancer or respiratory infections, and the, you know, the life expectancy is 78, well, that's still a fairly long health span. It's too bad you got it, but we'd like to extend both of those uh, out even more. So this is really what we're trying to do is by doing things in early childhood, we can, uh, and, and for me, I'm focused on helping kids eat healthy, uh, have, have a healthy weight, and also have uh, healthy sleep and airway hygiene. Um, this just came out, the Journal of the American Heart Association, or Cardiology, JAMA Cardiology. The kids with sleep apnea, if that's not corrected, um, they will develop high blood, high blood pressure, which is cardiovascular disease. And is that gonna go away? That's gonna stay with them. But if we can get them to sleep with their lips closed, not snoring, not sweating, not pee in their bed, uh, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of questions we ask the parents about how they, how their kids sleep. Um, but look at that. I mean, this is like, this just came out. Uh, and even though there's older literature that says kids are at risk for systemic disease, that they don't breathe well through their nose, um, this is really pretty solid evidence. <laughs> this is an example of what I do. Um, and you can see that that child's lower chin, of course, it looks better, but she can breathe better through her nose. Her symptoms went away. So uh, there's a lot of fake news, uh, a lot of misinformation, uh, disinformation, not misinformation, but intentionally putting stuff like, is it, you know, is it, can, can, scientists can't agree whether it's healthy or unhealthy to be overweight. Well, there is some evidence that if you are, slightly high in weight that, that you, you may be healthier, um, but obese, no, it's never good. Um, is smoking good for you? Can you believe this is even out there? Um, what is it, mouth breathing or nose breathing? What's the difference, you know? Um, and it, it's, again, this is like uh, something that even well-educated, I went out for dinner with my buddies that we, for 30 years, we've gone out uh, once or twice a year, and one of them wasn't there because he's not vaccinated, and he's a physician, but he refuses to get the available vaccinations. Uh, says he's holding out for a better one. I don't know. So, what are you going to do? Um, breathing starts in utero. It is that there's studies that's been done that the air pressure inside the womb is actually as thin as the air one mile above Mount Everest. Kids have adapted. Uh, throughout mammalian history to survive in a low O2 environment. But if a mom is snoring, that there's no margin of error there. That kid is already in a hypoxic environment and it's not hurting them. But if a mom, that's why the flight attendant says, put the mask on yourself first. You know, you got to save yourself. That, that, that the, the mother has priority really all over one nutrient and that's oxygen. Everything else, the, the fetus, the developing fetus has priority because a mom is not going to die of vitamin D deficiency, uh, but the baby needs it. So, Have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Coleman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe because when, as and if, any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health, we are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. And I concluded from that report... It's true. That it the babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the babies born from women who do not smoke. B.S. And some women yes. would prefer having smaller babies. Ever. It's like preposterous, but they, Winston took that and used it in advertising in, in the 50s. 
Uh, talk, talk about a win-win, easy labor, slim baby, and the full flavor of Winston's. And they got a pregnant woman on there. So anyway, um, this is, you know, what I mentioned earlier, nasal nitric oxide. Could that, you know, mitigate the severity of COVID-19? And this is a published study and it's, it's a hypothesis. Um, but, if, you know, again, this is recorded. Um, I can, I have PDFs of all these uh, articles if anybody wants them and I'll, I'll give my email at the end. So um, this is, you know, these are adenoids here. Uh, these are tonsils, obviously. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray. And I take these on two-year-olds and it's, it's less radiation than a cavity x-ray, like way less. It's not harmful. And we shield, we lead shield the kids and we share this with the ENT and the pediatrician. Many of my referrals are coming from physicians to, to expand these kids. Uh, but this is the most common cause of uh, airway obstruction. Uh, again, the craniofacial respiratory complex and sorry, your repetition again. Well, here, this shows you the size. Um, and, you know, really what they do for kids is they take out tonsils and adenoids or they put them on CPAP. Well, that's really, um, it, it does provide some mitigation, but it will not solve the problem. This should be done adjunctively or sometimes even instead of. Uh, I never would say that to an ENT because it's not my job, but uh, you know what I do say is um, at least after the adenoidectomy, will you please support that this child needs their jaws expanded? And I've got a lot of ENTs that are paying a lot of attention to what we're doing. Here's another thing when, you know, kids who get their adenoids and tonsils removed in childhood, and this is on, you know, 1.2 million children uh, into adulthood and a huge majority, a vast majority of them had respiratory issues when they were adults. Um, so there is, there's going to be some follow-up on this, but you know, it's just another reason. The morbidity, the post-operative morbidity of tonsil dendroid surgery in kids sometimes doesn't show up for decades. But if we can avoid having to do this or making it um, less likely to do this, uh, and when you take out adenoids in a kid, they can grow back. And a lot of kids who get their tonsils and adenoids out, they still have sleep and breathing problems. And then they come to me, well, okay, let's try expansion. And you know what, better late than never, I guess. So there we have, um, we talk about recurrent apnea after TNA surgery. This is uh, in a textbook on, aller on sleep and snoring. We've got like five book chapters, medical textbooks about our protocol. And this is a commentary I was asked to write about a century of adenoid uh, ectomy, adenotonsillectomy's failure to fully resolve sleep disorder breathing. Sleep disorder breathing, you know, snoring uh, is, is the mildest form of sleep disorder breathing and apnea is the most severe. We'd like to nip it in the bud, it's snoring and it never turns into apnea. Well, um, taking out tonsil nanoids sometimes has to happen, but it always should be done in conjunction with um, getting the jaws well developed. This is an adenoid, what it looks like. This is a two and a half year old, two years, nine months old. Um, they got the adenoidectomy, but it failed to solve the problem. So I expanded them. And um, so this is, it, it isn't just the adenoidectomy that, that um, made this airway bigger, but when I expanded, the, the jaw came forward as well. Um, this is how it works. Uh, I would, you know, what, what happens is the, the jaw, I did a little Photoshop here, um, is that when you expand it, it will grow forward in the soft palate, which is connected to the back of the hard palate, will come forward off the back of the airway. And it's non-surgical distraction is what we call it. And it really does give a beautiful aesthetic result. I was supposed to be a little, yeah, you can see how, uh, and that that just would not happen otherwise. That, that this, this would not go away. Um, that's, that's reliably persistent, but we can show before and after that all the sleep and breathing symptoms in this particular child was either fully resolved or resolving. And it, this is on, you know, on the vast majority of our patients, it doesn't always 100% um, correct everything, but it usually results in um, preventing them from getting worse, but, but almost always it does resolve most of the sleep and breathing problems and it resolves the malocclusion. Again, they still benefit from Invisalign when they're older, but this is the airway we're hypothesizing. We give a kid an airway like this, 
you know, it went, uh, the area that's from the back to the front went to uh, 156 from 67. Um, and the shape, that color there means that it's not elliptical, but the airway is now ovoid shaped. It's got a better volume here. This black denotes that it's like a collapsed uh, balloon. Like, you know, before you get a balloon and blow it up, it's just, it's collapsed. Uh, this is my daughter. Um, I didn't know how to do this when she was a baby. Uh, and she had to have her jaws broken and she got the jaw she wanted uh, to think I could have done that when she was four or five years old, that she wouldn't have needed that surgery, but she's, you know, and this is what the surgery looks like. Um, this is gross. If you're queasy, don't watch this, but this is what I can do non-surgically. If the kid is under six years old, we can help that jaw come forward naturally. Uh, I guess that's all I have here. Uh, and thank you for your attention.